there's a fine line too. One, you got to find a, a team that fits your level of play, right? Because one, you got to be able to be on the field no matter what. But two, you got to put the work in and be good because I could pick up the phone, but one, I'm not going to lie. So you are who you are. And it, and I'm not going to pick up a, the phone for somebody who hasn't earned the right for me to phone for them to advocate for because I'm not going to put my reputation on the line and no coach worth his salt. And that's one of the reasons why we have so much success or in the recruiting aspect is because when I talk to XYZ school and who I've known for 10, 15 years and I tell them something, they know it's going to be accurate. Hello and welcome to Catching You, a dad and daughter softball journey. I'm Rusty, a dad who's been in the dugout and on the sidelines. And I'm Lacey, the daughter whose journey through softball has been filled with incredible wins, tough losses, and so many lessons both on and off the field. For the past 16 years, we've navigated the highs and lows of softball together, from the local fields to national tournaments and everything in between. From the challenges of recruitment during COVID to the mental and emotional roller coaster that comes with being a student athlete, we'll be sharing the perspectives of both the parent and athlete and firsthand experience of the impact of sports on mental health and the importance of support from the sidelines. Oh, welcome back, everybody, to Catching You. I am your co-host, Rusty Hill, my other co-host, Lacey. She is off. We've given her the day off. But I do have a special guest with me. I have Coach Greg from Athletics Mercado. But she was, he was actually one of Lacey's, your 16U uh, coach at one point. So welcome, Greg. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, of course. Glad to do it. Yeah, thank you. So just a little bit of background of yourself. Did you play, obviously, I, I want to assume that you played sports, but what kind of <laughs> sports did you play and where'd you grow up? What kind of sports did you play? And then what led you to entering into the softball field? Sure. Just like everybody else, anybody my age or older, you played everything growing up and you found what you liked and ended up playing. Uh, baseball was my first passion and love. I started as a catcher, ended up as a pitcher. And that just was the love. But more importantly, right when I got out of high school, I started coaching. And I was coaching baseball at 18, 19 years old in that range. And I never stopped. It's actually how I met my wife was through coaching in Little League. And then my, our, our oldest daughter, my stepdaughter, Kendall, one day decided she wanted to play softball. So I'm like, okay, cool. Signed her up for the local rec league. And I was watching what the coach was doing. And I'm like, we're not doing that. <laughs> and I jumped in. <laughs> and next thing you know, you fall in love with the sport, the speed, the athleticism. And I did the rec ball and the all-star thing for a couple of years and took our, our league's first team over to the ASA nationals and thought that I had it all figured out. Then I jumped in the travel ball world right around, I don't know, 2007, eight, something like that. And just never left. Yeah. It's a, it's a, been an interesting journey to say the least, but you never expect the, I figured I'd coach baseball all the way through and all that stuff. And I got into softball and never wanted to leave. That's right. Yeah. So we have, well, we have, football, 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 by the way, <laughs> what's that? Softball, said, baseball should be. That's that, that exactly. Yeah. I tell everyone, once you go to softball, you don't want to go back to baseball because yeah. it's so boring. No, I love baseball, the, the nuances of it, but softball is so much faster and yet and you still have those strategies and all that kind of stuff. We have similar stories. Like once I graduated high school, I started coaching basketball right when I was 19 years old and then have stopped. So pretty cool that we have similar stories there. You are now, how long have you been with Athletics Mercado? Probably like seven, eight years. I don't know. It, they all run together after a they while. They all run together. Now. Yeah, I remember when you guys first started because Lacey was a bat buster and then with the Athletics Mercado and then you, and you guys actually are in our backyard. So it was cool to see you grow to where you guys are at now. You do have a daughter currently now. Her name's Lauren at the University of Kentucky. Congratulations on that. It's awesome. This is a father daughter podcast. Mm -hmm. As you know, I've had a couple stories with different podcasts at our podcast where I put a lot of pressure on her as a father because of the organization she was in. She was a bat buster and I was putting pressure on her to perform because if she didn't perform, it looked bad on me. I looked as a father, if she didn't perform then, then I thought I, you know, I failed her as a father. And so I was putting so much pressure on her and we were doing pitching lessons and then we're, we're doing a bullpen at our house. 
I didn't treat her very well when she had a bad bullpen session. I would, I would get super upset with her because then I'm like, oh, she's going to now go to these games. She's going to suck. And Campbell's going to not, is going to sit her and she's not going to get a scholarship. So I had all these things going on in my head as far as a father, right? And so I, I pushed that onto her and she broke, right? One day as 12 years old, she was in the kitchen crying, like, why are you acting this way? Why are you treating me this way? So we had a good, that was a good breakthrough for us. I'm not sure what your relationship with Lauren, did you coach her? How long did you coach her? Why didn't you coach her? And then we can get into some other, yeah. other some other things as far it's, as father daughter. Yeah. Dynamics. Probably a little different for me and Lauren, just for the sheer fact that she grew up on the dirt and all that. I was already coaching travel and at a very high level when, when she was born and actually not when she was born, but in her formative years, say three, four, five years old, got pictures with her in Colorado with me at events and right. all this good stuff. But yeah, other than like the rec ball, Hey, we're going to, I'm going to coach that team and get them started off the foot. We made a conscious effort that I did not coach her. This way I can still be dad. And I did take her team for two years in 14s just for the recruiting piece because we weren't going to leave that part to anybody else to trust that they had the connections I had or anything else like that. So I did coach her for 14s. And then once she was done in 14s, we kicked her straight up to our 18 gold team. Right. Uh, and then I went back to 16s full time. And that's right around the time when Lacey was playing for me. Uh, yeah. But that was a goal of us as a family was for me not to coach her directly. And I took a different um, approach with her where I would show her the, hey, this is the avenue you should think of. But she was also the kid that you got to slow down because she was going to go 110 at an all time. Venue. She was a pitcher when she was young. Best day ever is when she stopped pitching. Uh, because you could empathize with this, I'm sure. Every single yeah. pitch matters so much, and I could not understand why. I'm like, I've been around this game forever, and I'm having anxiety over, you know. <laughs> so the best day yep. ever was when she stopped pitching. Uh, but she did the, the the EM training twice a week. They did it or batting practice. They did. She's going six days a week. Friday was her only day off, unless we had games or something like that. And so, but I I tried to do the best to let her choose her own path in it and not be you know the thumb down on her for for lack of a better term to some degree i wish i would have been a little bit more but at the same time it worked out just fine for her god's okay. not ours yeah so a uh, great point on on just being wanting to be a dad a lot of dads out there want to coach their kid because they want to have total control throughout their whole journey right it's because they think they know they better. yeah <laughs> Yeah. Some don't trust other people. Maybe they had a bad experience with a team. So they're like, screw it. I'm going to, I'm going to take it and I'm going to, and I'm going to take my daughter. And a lot of people get upset because it's daddy ball and she's the source out. She's batting second when she's probably not very good. When Lauren was on your team for the 14, first year and second year 14s, what was that like co coaching your own daughter? Number one. And then number two, you talked about the recruiting part of your connections. I, I, I want to touch on that a little bit because at she had a different si situation prior to getting here with you. And I wanted to talk about that as well. But when you had Lauren on your team, what kind of advice would you give other dads that have their kids on their team? Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, such a different dynamic. And we had a really good squad. We we're you know, as good as it got at that particular age group, we finished top yeah. five in PGF as a first year 14 team. And then our second year, we were ranked number one, whatever those rankings were, and we didn't finish it off. But there, there's a couple of instances where I can look back and I should have said, hey, you know what? I should have pulled Lauren in this situation. And uh -huh. I didn't make that move. Now, it, it wasn't because I was playing daddy ball, but it was just one of those things where you probably do get a little bit worried about that ride home a little bit with your wife or something like that <laughs> as you pull her yeah. or something. But there was only yeah. one instance really that I thought, and it was a tournament up in Northern California, the PGF ultimate shootout or whatever. We're down or we're, we're tied one, one with this team that had no business playing with us, but they're getting, and my screen doesn't go wide enough for the zone that they were, this umpire was getting. He had to be straight out of rec ball, never did travel ball in his game. He's getting not only the batter's box, he's getting 
midpoint of the other batter's box. Oh, really? And, but lefties were hitting this kid really well. And I had Maya Perez, who's at Texas A&M now on yeah. the bench because she wasn't in the lineup that particular one. And I was in a situation. I'm like, no, nah, Lauren's been clutch. She's always been through. She's making hard contact in this game. It's fine. Right. I should pinch titter right there for Maya Perez. <laughs> <Game's> <laughs> a lot different. So, <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it's one of those things because even if you are doing everything right and you're being totally across the board and. They always say that coaches are harder on their own kids than anybody else. And but at the same time, there's just that perception that would be happened from anybody who isn't in your shoes that they, it's a tough area to uh, navigate sometimes. Yeah, I've only had to do it once and I'll never do it again. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess my advice. Yeah, exactly. My advice to fathers is just treat them just like any other player. I know it's hard because you're the father. Sometimes you need to take a step back and be the coach rather than being a father. And because there's a lot of dynamics, you have people tripping in your ears probably all the time. Oh, why is she playing? And all this because, you know, dad is the coach or whatever. Funny story though, you said that you guys were top five in first year four teams. I don't know if you remember, but you beat our team. <laughs> I knew Campbell, you, Campbell's team, Lacey, actually, that was, she just got back from her injury. And PGF was yep. her first tournament from her injury, her head injury. And she happened to, happened to, she got the starting nod against your team and didn't fare too well, but yeah, but congratulations. I won't talk about what that. the score of that game was, but I do remember it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, I think she walked the first four batters and Campbell's like, okay, you're out. <laughs> but, but she's coming off an injury and that's her first sermon. So you got to give her a little break. And, and um, honestly, I, I get it. That That's one of those things. PGF, it just, it happens so fast. It happens so fast. Yeah. I do want to thank you. I don't know if I ever officially thanked you for taking on Lacey on your team because the the teams that she was on, Campbell and Stith, those guys, colleges, they didn't necessarily go to colleges. They never called colleges and said, hey, I have this girl, right? It was mainly, hey, <laughs> you're coming to us. Whoever you need, then you come to us. So that was rough for Lacey because they didn't really, they didn't really go to Colleges weren't looking at Lacey at the time because she was throwing high fifties, maybe low sixties. And so the colleges were only coming for her. <laughs> so she wasn't getting any looks. And then I, I wanted to thank you for taking her on it. Cause once we got on your team, you immediately started calling coaches and we immediately got into, we went to North Carolina to visit, which was super cool. And then COVID hit and I think COVID screwed a lot of that up, but I, I wanted to thank you personally for, for taking her on and advocating for her because I, I think for people that are listening you need to find the right organization that's going to advocate for your daughter obviously your daughter has to put in the work right I, I i know a lot about your organization you don't take girls that are <laughs> they just half-ass it you you're you're, yeah. you're gonna take girls that are gonna go after it for themselves but you're also gonna advocate right you're gonna it's almost effort for effort right you're gonna pour gas on those girls that are, that are kicking some butt right Absolutely. There's a fine line too. One, you got to find a, a team that fits your level of play, right? Because one, you got to be able to be on the field no matter what. Mm -hmm. But two, you got to put the work in it be, because I could pick up the phone, but one, I'm not going to lie. So you are who you are and it, and I'm not going to pick up a for, the phone for somebody who hasn't earned the right for me to pick up the phone for them to advocate for, because I'm not going to put my reputation on the line and no coach worth his salt is. And that's one of the reasons why we have so much success or in the recruiting aspect is because when I talk to XYZ school and who I've known for 10, 15 years and I tell them something, they know it's going to be accurate or it's good, wrong, or indifferent. My opinion matters because they know I'm not trying to sell them the bill of goods for lack of a better term, that they know what they're getting in, in that process, but that's only built up through years of building relationships and just being open and honest with people. And that includes the player because everybody's got those top 10 lists. Oh, I want to go to Oklahoma. I want to go to UCLA. I want to go to those. But you don't have that type of talent level. You need to relay that to the player so they can adjust their expectations of where their current talent level is at. That's really what the most important part of recruiting is just being open and honest. With I could be wrong, right? But not often. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've seen it. I seen it firsthand, right? You guys are in our backyard, and a lot of your girls went to the high school that Lacey went to. And I see there's you're just pumping them out, and these girls are going to 
some really good colleges. So September 1st okay. just happened. What advice do you give? Because Lacey was devastated September 1st because it never happened. <laughs> right. And I'm sure there were some girls September 1st were expecting a phone call at 1201 and it never happened. And then they expect a phone call right before they go to school and it never happened. What kind of advice would you give those girls? Because there's a lot of girls that have unrealistic expectations. They think they play on a travel ball team and they're going to get a call at 1201. What kind of advice would you give those girls? Not everyone's going to get a call that and get a call. Yeah, that. That's such a good point. So one thing I try to do is I get a pretty good gauge on where the athletes are before September 1 hits. And I usually schedule two calls. One with the no brainers who I know are going to get 10, 15 calls. We've had plenty of those kids through the years. Mm -hmm. And we give them a list of questions that, Hey, these are the things that you should be thinking about when you're talking to schools and what's important to you. And then I have another call with the, the question marks and I, I don't mean to label them as question marks, but I just don't know if any school a call, you're going to get five calls. Hey, we might need to go to work and reevaluate. And you'd be surprised. I have kids right now in the SEC that are starting in the SEC. Didn't get any calls in September 1st. They didn't commit till October, November of their junior year after we got back on the recruiting trail. It's definitely one, not the end of the journey. It's the start of the recruiting period, which is a big change. When Lauren came through, she committed the very last day before the rule changed in the eighth grade. That's, we started the process really early with her, but that's the biggest thing is one, it's just a starting point. It's not the ending point. And I understand how social media works and the anxiety level that these kids are feeling and the pressure that like, Hey, I'm supposed to be committed now. Yeah. I think it's lightening up a little bit. I hope because when they shut off the water valve from the recruiting rule change, that's it. Uh -huh. those 21s and 22s were the ones that were like, Oh my God, I was about to commit. And I could think of a couple of kids that went to Lacey's high school that they would have let the rule open. They would have had their pick of the litter come fall of their freshman year, whatever it was, their sophomore year. And right. once that rule changed, all right, their commitment level didn't remain the same. And they didn't go to a school until very recently and like JC stuff. I know what you're um, talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the most talented kids that were at that age group. Uh, I do the rule change to the junior year to digress right. a little bit, but that's my biggest thing. A and then two, don't jump at the first offer. No matter if you didn't get a call straight away, take your time as much as possible because the transfer portal is a real thing and we want to keep you out of it. Yeah. And that is also what the other biggest piece of the puzzle is so many PSAs, potential student athletes that are coming up through high school have no idea they are competing against every single kid in college right now and for that same scholarship dollars. Now, there's some things that are coming down the pipe where it looks like we might be moving into headcount sport, uh, which would mm. be awesome, which is going to uh, really even the playing field a little bit uh, yeah. and have more money available for the schools that are going to be able to have it for more potential student athletes rather than just the transfer portal. Right. So that's exciting. Um, I'm very interested to see that. I don't think every school's going to do it because they're not everybody's going to have the budget for it, but uh, your power fours, the fact that we call it power yeah. four now is funny. Power four it's now, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, bigger dollar mid majors that have good programs, they'll be just fine. But that is exciting for the sport. I think it should be a headcount sport as well. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, uh, power four, just go on that. We just recently spoke with uh, Des Rivera, went to Oregon State. And she said a story that Oregon State offered her right on the spot. And she says, oh, I need to think about it. And then she called you and you said, did you take it? <laughs> and she says, no. And he goes, what are you talking about? And she, you told her to take that deal right away. But you're like, what, what, how many Pac-5s, how many Pac-12 teams have offered you? And she says, none. She goes, okay, and then you need to take it. And she's okay, I'll take it. But speaking of the and, transfer and, portal. And honestly, but, Go ahead. Real quick on Des, it wasn't about her taking the offer because I'm always the, you never commit on site, but right. she had all these big guys. She was that, oh, I want Oklahoma and all this stuff. And I'm like, you got all these mid-majors, but you want power five. This is your one power five. So, yeah, yeah. And she got a great offer. And she had a great deal. Great yeah. um, I, so, I, I do want to touch on the, what you said about the question marks, right? And there's 
definitely more question mark girls out there than there are the ones that are going to get the 15 calls yeah. and like that. I appreciate that. And this is why I wanted to bring it up is I appreciate that you're making the calls to those girls and say, Hey, here's the expectations, right? This is where I see you. And this is where I see colleges. This is the, these is where I see colleges that you will go to. You may not get a call. If you work hard, you might go to these colleges that you want to, but you also need to be looking at these other ones. Maybe. I, I, I wouldn't, I just wanted to bring that up. I, I appreciate that because not every coach is going to call the question mark to say, Hey, you might not get a call. So I, I won't. Hopefully more and more coaches are taking inventory of that. I imagine anybody that's been doing it for a number of years and you're especially up in those 16s and 18s that you yeah. get a feel for this. You really do. I used to be able to tell you exactly when a kid would go, so to speak, oh, you're going to go fall your sophomore year. You're going to go spring your junior year. You're going to have to sweat it out a little. Like you can usually get a gauge of that, but more so now that the rule changed. There's no reason not to have continual conversations with your athletes and your families uh, and just prepare them the best you can. Let's take a quick break. If you want to leave us a message, use the link in the show notes. And if you want us to respond, leave your name and email address. Also, please rate us and or leave a review as we're trying to grow the show every day. Finally, Lacey and I both love coffee. We would greatly appreciate any contribution to the show. That link is also in the show notes. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Let me ask you this on the transfer portal, right? Obviously, it's a big deal. Tons of girls are transferring. Obviously, with the Pac-12 breaking up, that's that was going to happen, right? There was a lot of girls, at, especially Oregon State, Washington State. They're like, what about us? They're not going to hang out in the West Coast and play San Jose State <laughs> and those type of plays, those teams. But talk to me about the transfer. To me, what I'm seeing is that it's almost being used as a, a higher end JC where they, they commit to a certain college knowing that they're going to transfer to the college that they actually want to go to after a couple of years. Oh, Jets, is that safe to say? Am I overreaching there a little bit? No. Well, like, I'm sure there's probably some aspect of that to whereas a kid thinks that they have power four, power five talent, but for whatever reason, they didn't have spots available or what, and think that they can go put up numbers for a year somewhere and then be able to move up to a higher school. As far as the mid majors, I do see that as a, let's be real, the, the big fish are eating up the, the, the best players on those teams uh, to come to them. So that is a real thing. The, the, the hard part is the amount of kids who think that just by putting their name in the portal, that there's going to be a school waiting for them on the backside with no numbers because you sat all year, you're going to have to rely on a relationship of your old travel or somebody who was recruiting you back in the day and hope that they have money on that. The number of kids that just blindly go in their portal because things are hard or things weren't just, oh, they didn't type the bow in my hair right or whatever the case may be that jump in there for silly reasons is that's a problem and that's one thing that i, I don't think enough people really understand that uh, there des is a perfect example not that she jumped in for right wrong reasons or whatever but she had to sit out for a whole uh semester because she didn't find the right fit when she jumped in there, there there's definitely aspects of that now she's at a great school she's doing great and, and all that now but that's my biggest thing with the portal itself is I've had kids jump in the portal, then call me afterwards. Hey, I'm in, I'm in the portal. Can you help me? And why'd you go you in? Help me. Yeah. And they don't really have a solid answer and it's hard getting them recruited once. And now you, we're doing you it. recommend two. now. <laughs> so, I don't well, know. I, then I guess for you, it would be like, I mean, I think for you, it'd be like, you'll call me before you make that decision and let's have a discussion. Right. I don't know. That was probably the best yeah, just because we never want to encourage anybody to go out of the portal. You want to encourage them to, Hey, figure it out. You committed to this school for a reason, right? They were your dream. Remember I saw all these posts, your family's Facebook feed was all, I don't want to single out a school, but a school for two and a half years, what changed? Oh, it got hard because now they're actually coaching you. You got to do 6 a.m. weights. You got to do study halls and all this stuff. And oh, you didn't realize that living in a dorm sucks sometimes. Right. 
we've had ex we've had ex players we've had we had Delaney Spalding on here we've had some ex pro players on here and it's Lacey's senior year a lot of and 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 it coincides with what we're just talking about some girls their senior year they just want it over with because maybe they had a bad experience and they just it just they just want it they just want the season to be over with and just want their softball career to be done some are like this was the best time of my life and I don't want it to end and I possibly want to go pro. What advice? I don't know if you have any advice. Lacey just wants to have fun this year. She also wants to be successful because she's very competitive, but it, it this seems like because softball, there's usually an end, right? There's not a lot of girls go on to the pros and quite honestly, I, I don't think they pay enough for a pro at the pros. It, I don't know why some of these girls will go because they're, like, they're, they're getting pennies on the dollar, but what should, should they have some sort of expectation in their senior year? Like, I don't know, what kind of advice would you give somebody that is a you senior know, that is, it's about to end, like their seasons, their softball career is about to end. Yeah. And that's going to be different for each individual kid, for sure. This is a fantastic sport that does so much for so many people. And it really is a vehicle for so many kids to get their degrees, to go to grad school, to become lawyers or doctors or whatever the case may be of what they want to actually do in life. And vast majority of athletes in general, that's what they end up doing, going into the workforce in some manner. My personal, just enjoy every second of it. If you're not playing for whatever re reason, enjoy the process of it. And understand that you just did the hardest thing that you might ever do in your life and that not everybody can do it. And if it was easy, everybody would do it. But it is really I'm just watching, even as a father, watching what my daughter's going through. Obviously, I've been around the sport a long time. I've had hundreds of kids go off to college through our teams one way or another, but you still don't get an idea of how hard it is until you see your kid going through it and really what they are actually doing day in, day out. That's a grind that they are going in. And for you to go through, whether you played every single inning, you played part-time or you're a role player, whatever the case may be, you just accomplished something great. And right. hopefully you made the best out of it, no matter what your situation was, because you, you, it's a fast four years. It really is. And you hear people say, oh, it goes by so fast. It goes, you don't think about it, but man, it really goes by fast yeah and, and enjoyed it. it yeah it's a great point too because especially being with the mercados or bat busters and these high end and the expectations and what they're we they go through the and, 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 every year yes yeah the, so <laughs> the, yeah the for us it was always okay it's national title not national title or bus but it was we're gonna get a national title and then the recruiting will come with it because if you're a top team and you're vying for a national championship College is going to be like, okay, I don't want to look at that team. And I want some of those girls. But what I, I think what you were saying is, is these girls, it's just grind, grind. And then all of a sudden it just stops. Yep. And then that mindset, their mental health. And a lot of like she's getting into a lot of the mental health aspect. A lot of it's grind, grind, it stops. And then they're, they like, look, look up in the air. Okay. Now what? So for some girls, it's hard. Is Lauren thinking about that kind of stuff now or is she just trying to enjoy the moment he wants to go to law school after this and oh, okay will become a lawyer and she had an internship to help that this past summer like she's yeah don't get me wrong she's in there in the thick of it fighting competing but i don't think there's any aspirations to do anything beyond college she knows that this is the last two years of her softball career at the moment let's be real they Probably don't know what they want for breakfast tomorrow. We'll see what happens. But at the end of the day, she's definitely under the, hey, I want to go get to the World Series and yeah. set up myself for the best I can for the rest of my life. And then, so as a father, do you, how often do you, do you try to make everything? Do you have certain tournaments that you try to make to go see? Well, I know you took a couple of days. I know you took a couple of years off to, to yeah, I, walk her, right? I, I still, what I did is I didn't take any teams. I didn't take a team last year. I just stayed with our gold team and was an assistant. So I had a little bit more flexibility uh, to come oh, okay. and, go and go watch as many series as she, as I could. The year before I was supposed to do the same thing, but I ended up going back and taking a 16 U team because we had a team that we needed to 
some help with. So I ended up taking a team when I wasn't supposed to. And it was one of the funnest years I had. We weren't the top team in our program or anything like that, but yet we were one out away from finishing top 10 at nationals. We had a great chemistry, great parents. It was awesome. And those, some of those kids are starting their freshman year in college now, but it was really a fun year. And actually it, it's one of the t- best teams I've ever had, not in the sheer aspect of how good we were, but it reminded me of why I got into coaching. And that's actually why this year I'm dropping down and going to 12U so I can keep on teaching again. No. Yeah. So I'm going to take a 12U team for the first time. Uh, you know, they were really good. They were in the PGF finals and tens, and now they're going up in yeah. the next division and I'm taking over that squad. And, oh boy. We're going to have some fun. <laughs> there you go. Whether they know it yet or They're not. not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm glad you said PGF. PGF or Alliance? They're PGF preference? all day, every day for myself. And that's for always my preference. And the main reason for that is I don't think that it is a spoiled aspect perspective for me is we're in Southern California. There is no reason why we need to jump on the plane when PGF has the best weather. It has great competition. There's some things, their balls are horrible and they do not fly. They need to do something about that, but that's a whole nother story. But that is right. the only thing wrong with that tournament. But I was not a fan of the split in general, but I, I, I get it. Yeah. I've done both as far as Alliance or PGF. And I just, I like the PGF model so much better, just personally. I understand different people have different ideas of what this sport needs to be or what they can get out of this sport. And whatever works for each other. I like the thought of the model of ball, like the, the women's college world series model. But at the end of the day, you could go to Alliance and finish in the top 10 and only play three teams, three different teams. If you did oh, the right. model in a certain way, I think it might've modified right. a little bit when they added the extra team into the super regional rounds, but when it was just two teams, you could just go through and play three teams and you're finishing the top 10, but you got bounced or whatever. So that's one thing I wasn't necessarily a fan of. And the way they do the rankings, oh, one through 16, leaves a little bit to be desired of, oh, how did this team? Okay, I'll give you a perfect example. So my 16 and under year, three years ago, we were the number one ranked team, okay? Went into Alliance, number one ranked. We were really good there. We just won Colorado. We were mowing. We won Triple Crown Nationals. And then we run up against Texas Blaze in the super regional round. They have Taylor Townsend, the kid that's on the U.S. national team going to Florida. They have AK-47. I can't remember her real name, but she's Kowalski or something. Like she's at Florida now. They were really good. You're telling me that's the 16th ranked team when I don't want to throw some of the other teams out there that were like in a different thing where I'm like, no, those guys are horrible. How are they not that put in? Right, yeah, right. They, they they took us out in three games, so we didn't even make the Elite Eight as the number one ranked team. And it's all speculative, but at the right. same time, I know they put them there for a reason. Just saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very cool. I appreciate your time, Greg. Again, thank you again for uh, coming on, number one. Number two, thanks for having Lacey on your team and buying for her and advocating for her. I, I appreciate that, and I, I respect Athletic Mercado. You guys are in our backyard, and I see a lot of the girls that come through our high school, and they're all good girls, and they do a good job. So I appreciate you coming on. Good luck this season, and good luck. Next, uh, I'm going to need the patience, so I can pray for me. And we'll pray for you. All right, uh, Greg, take care, and we'll see you later. Sounds good. All right, thanks, man. Good stuff. 